And um, I just want to uh, tell folks, um, I'll introduce you uh, to, to Carol D'Anverno. Um, okay. She is a, an artist uh, now currently working out of um, uh, Brooklyn, New York, and is um, a practicing artist. She does a lot of uh, workshops and goes to a lot of uh, residencies and goes and um, gets her ideas mostly from the history of the place. Uh, a few years back, she had a show at the Mercer Gallery, the Monroe Community College Gallery. And her whole focus was about Rochester and what Rochester uh, meant to her after doing research. She came in uh, prior to the show and went to uh, the George Eastman House, to our Science Center and kind of uh, focused the imagery based on that. And then a few years after that, I invited her back to do a permanent mural that is now um, in the college's fine art department on the first floor by the music department. And uh, she worked with another uh, fellow artist to have that completed. And there, we were, she was up for about a week and it was really nice to see somebody do some work of painting. Fun. And it's held up very well. Um, if you, oh, were, to it, <laughs> we were, you were to see it today, you'd say it's just like I painted it the other day. Uh, that's good. So if you guys ever get a chance to be on campus, I don't know how many of you are actually having classes on campus. There's only about 500 students wow. currently that have classes on campus. Most of them are the science students and the nursing and dentistry and then uh, visual and performing arts um, has their video uh, group on campus a couple times a week because that's a little more difficult uh, to, um, to teach virtually. So right. I want to welcome Carol. She has a PowerPoint for us and is going to talk a little bit about the things I just noted. And then we'll open up for questions and uh, the hopes that you all have, you know, something that uh, ticked and you want to, you know, find out further about it. So if you want to keep notes and, you know, formulate a question uh, towards the end, we'll allow that. Well, hello, everyone. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Kathleen, for inviting me. Strange medium, but hey, if we can share something, I think it's worth doing it. Um, so the way I set up the PowerPoint, I just kind of give you kind of where I come from and why I'm interested in history. And then we just kind of go through two or three of these, I think three of these um, shows that I put together. And then um, some, um, there's a couple of videos in there so you can take a little break from images. And then they're all numbered. So if you have a specific question on um, a painting or something, refer to that and you can ask me later. So it'll make it a little easier for everyone. So I'm going to share the screen, I guess, so we can start the presentation. Um, and I think we should, should we just, how do you want to do it, Kathleen? Do you want to just wait for the end for questions or should we just kind of, if something comes up in the middle of it or should we just wait? What's your best, what's your take? If you don't want to be interrupted, then we'll, we'll leave it that way. They, okay, they know enough, they, the students know enough to raise their hand too okay. or to um, unmute and maybe ask a question less. Okay, we can do it um, after. Evasive. Okay. okay, so I'll just share the screen now. What? That's not mine. This is mine. All right. So we're going to go. So I'm going to start with this, which is where I grew up. I grew up part of the time in Belgium and part of the time in uh, Italy. I'm 65 years old. I just turned 65. So I was born in 1956. Um, Spa, Belgium was this little town in, in the Bastogne area. I, the reason why I put some of those images at the bottom, that's a kappa. Um, on the left, the lower left, is a, it's a photography by Kappa, and um, basically that area in the, the what is called Wallonia, which is a French part, speaking part of Belgium, was um, the theater of one of the worst, worst messes in the in the, in the war. I mean, thousands of people died there. It was just it was just months and months of bloodshed and. So I kind of grew up with these, all these things, like there, there'll be like a small light tank, you know, chained to some weird little makeshift uh, monument. So this is everywhere. You could see that everywhere. So I was born basically post-World War II, surrounded by a lot of, um, by the adults being pretty much shell-shocked and not 
not knowing how to process what had happened. We have to realize that 40 million people died during that war. So this was like a four and a half to five years war. So um, everybody had lost somebody and all the adults were in shock and, but they also didn't wanna talk about it. So again, I, I grew up seeing all these cemeteries and all these people missing limbs and you just, but not having explanation made it that I was kind of became really obsessed in trying to find out out of sheer fear, why was this like this? So. Um, this is the second town that I grew up in, in Italy, Casino. So you can see on the upper left, that's Casino. Um, and that's what was left at the end of the war. The entire town was up against the hill. And above it, that's the lower left picture. That's the Abbey of Monte Cassino. And that was completely flattened by the Allies because they had heard that there were Germans in there. It turned out to be there were only civilians. So. It was a catastrophic event, but again, that entire area also was um, hit heavily um, during the war. So grew up with that. And so that's kind of what the deal is. So I'm, we're gonna jump to what I do now. Um, and actually, no, this is kind of like what really got me going when I was young. I, we used to go um, to field trips and Kind of the thing with Italy is like you're lucky that you know you can go to field trips and in less than a day you're up in you know either in Firenze or all these places and these are three of probably the elements that inspired me the most when I was a kid when I first saw them I was about 12 when I saw the Campanile di Giotto the bell tower of Giotto that was designed by him and it was just giving me this incredible impression kind of walking up and every window was giving me a different view of the city um just gorgeous and Paestum is um upper right is one of the um that's very much a greek or greek um it's it's all greek temples there they don't quite know exactly what each temple represents because you know it's been so they have they're still trying to figure it out but this is a very basic doric you know um the basis of basically Greek art. And this was such a shock for me when I saw it. Um, it literally stopped my heart when I first saw it. I was 12 years old. We all came out running out of these buses. We had been stuck in there for hours and we ran and it was like um, sunset. So if you know that the way they, they, the negative spaces in between those columns actually is an amphora. It looks like a vase. Um, so the sun was come, you know, the sun was setting and I remember I was just running like every, and I just screeched to a halt. And I remember thinking, I was just so young, but I remember thinking, no, oh, if this is art, if this is what beauty is, I want to be part of it at somehow, you know? And then another great, for me, another great inspiration is still probably Giotto, the Cappella degli Scrovegni, um, because I think with the storytelling power that he has and how, you know, he can tell a story with such passion and such love and, and the beauty of the language, of course, you know, so those are things that influenced me when I was a kid. Um, so this is a video of a, of a um, long scroll that I did. I had kind of hit the wall at one point and I went to the Vermont Street Center at a residency and I basically spent two straight weeks drawing, you know, just tiny line by tiny line on this long piece of paper because I was completely lost. So this is hopefully this, whoops, nope. Hopefully this works. Oh, here it is. So this is just a short so you can sit back and relax. <laughs> um, it's not, the colors are not as vibrant as this an old, but. And I used gouaches and to do this drawing and it kind of just revealed something that I had lost somehow so um, that's one good thing about doing these resonances if you're by yourself and you spend so much time just on your own I think it just really brings refocus your mind if you need to which happens to it when you spend years you know working as an artist something happened in there that had to do with maps and history and, and shapes and all this stuff became kind of like my mother lore. This became kind of the basis to reboot myself.
So this was in 2013. So, and these are some of the drawings that I did there. Um, going back to um, gouache and trying to just simplify the language. I had been working for 20 years with um, oil and I really had reached the point where it had been become so, um, it was just too beautiful. It was like the bug to the light. And I was just, you know, it was so beautiful that I kind of lost all content. It was just all about how beautiful the material was rather than what I wanted to do. So I think doing these millions of, of lines slowly just slowed me down and, and calmed me down and I was able to kind of rethink things. So this is the, the show that I had at SUNY at your, at your college. Um, and it's called A Way of Saying and it's based on the history of Rochester. So I put in a couple of things to it. So um, this is uh, the picture on the lower right is Sarah Codger, who was a um, enslaved person. And um, so during the WTO times, they send out writers and photographers um, all across the United States, primarily in the South to record um, the stories of these enslaved folks and how the head lived and how, so there is, but what was amazing to me is that how they were very much, they tried to really, try, they didn't translate anything. They just kept the way of saying basically meant you are going to record them the way they spoke with, you know, with the regional accents and the regional sayings of the areas, the different areas that they're from. So, and because Rochester is so much part of the, um, the Underground Railroad and all that, I felt that there was such a connection. And then, but I also was trying to find a way that it was an emotional kind of entry point within the, the work. So looking at her photo, the one thing that I could totally relate to is the shawl that she wore. because everybody around me, all the women around me when I was a kid wore these shawls because people didn't have really much heat in their houses and stuff. So. It was a common thing, but I also understood that idea of just, you know, so I, that became, as you can see at the top, I used that reference to, to make the, and that became basically the title uh, piece for the show. It's small, but you know, it has, and so the one next to it, the covenant is, a, is based on the 13 colonies and the covenant that was made with the Iroquois. Again, that's that idea of just community and closing things. And so, um, and then these are also based on trip and sound swirls are based on basically readings I had done of um, folks that were escaping sla slavery and how they were listening to sounds. They wanted to, you know, in the middle of the night and follow those sounds and maybe to safety, hopefully. And then while this is going on, of course, every day, um, contemporary history keeps going. So the breath thickness was happened for, you know, Eric Gardner was killed. And so, and that piece is basically based, there is a starkness to it because I always think about, I think that that sense of just how there's so much that is not um, recorded emotionally, not how we let a lot of things go. So, um, because I, as um, Kathleen mentioned, I was in um, at the the history museum there, and they have um, an exhibit on um, you know the um, underground railroad and everything, and they have these artifacts, and one of them is a. It doesn't say what are they, who knows where they got it. It's been there for a long time. There isn't really a, a not, you know, they don't say where they got it. They probably don't know. Um, but it's basically one of these gold colors that would have belonged to a, um, a king or somebody of, you know, high importance in a, um, somewhere in a, in a country or in a tribe or whatever it was, somebody important in, in, in a country or in an area in Africa that was then, 
taken. And so that was, they lost that. So that, that became that gold center became that sense of loss of history of past history and how we don't want to connect with that and respect that at some level. So, um, and this is circle of light is again, looking for reading through those passages, um, enslaved folks escaping refer to a circle of light and looking for a circle of light. Is that the right one? Is that the safe one? Clustering is just a, a take on the history very specifically of Rochester because it was the first, it was known as the flower town, the flower as making bread. And they had a lot of, lot of these um, mills. So, and they describe 1600, something like how they had like these constant fights where the water was coming with these wheels and people were fighting and who had the right to be at the top where the water was the most powerful to use for the mills. And the white, blue and, and yellow is, are the colors of uh, Rochester. Now, I, I wanna specify, I, I wanna also say that a lot of this, I spend a lot of time doing research, but when I'm, once I'm done, I put out all that away. So the work comes out in a much more emotional way. So I don't wanna make it sound like, oh, I've got it all. Um, you know, figured out. I mean, there's definitely once I'm done doing research, I let go and just whatever comes up is what really touched me or interests me. So um, this is a big show that I had at the same time called Far West. And that kind of gives you a sense of how I go about collecting information. And sometimes it's just because I'm English is my third language. I'm always kind of fascinating about how people say things. I mean, you know, you know, we're, and, and all that in my head, they, all that creates shapes, ways of saying things. And so this is all that, you know, I had all these maps and because this was really about the, you know, after the end of the Indian Wars, so-called Indian Wars, 1862, I believe, I'm pretty bad with dates. Um, the West was definitely taken over and conquered and, you know, all the way to the edge. So, um, so this is another, um, this is a residency that I did at Summer Lake, La Playa. It's an incredible space on, a, on, a, um, on the high desert of Oregon. And um, so I had a small room, I spent a month there and it was preparing for this big show far west. So this is how much work I did within like about three weeks that I was there. So it's just a phone, you know, a lousy phone picture, but it gives you a sense of what all these vocabulary is coming out, all the stuff that I've studied, just kind of, it's piling out. It's just all just kind of resonating with each other. And I'm just kind of letting it go. Just, I'm, I'm very um, compulsive in terms of accumulating stuff because I feel like that somewhere in there, I may find something that's useful. <laughs> So I spend a lot of time in that. And these are mostly uh, watercolors, inks, and uh, pencils. Yeah. So. And then this was, um, it ends with this, the way of the Argonaut was the original title, but everybody kept asking me who the Argonauts were. So I gave it up and I called it Far West. Um, so this is the show itself. The, and it's this big gallery in Seattle. And, you know, as you can see, there is just all these, resonances and all these things kind of happening. There was just a huge amount of work. I think I had about a hundred pieces up. I mean, because I kind of, the idea was that when I went into it, the amount of information was staggering. I mean, there's just so much that happened from the end of the Indian Wars onto, um, you know, the, the blowing out and, and the taking over the West of the, what's called, you know, the Western states. So um, yeah, so I felt like, and here are some of them. Again, a reference is Arizona Mary on your right, on your left. At the bottom there on the right, there is a picture of her. You can see her down there, tiny. Um, she, her name was, she was known as Arizona Mary and she was one of the great trailblazers. Um, she was hired to take future settlers across the plains. She could um, command, you know, a team of oxen of 16 oxes. Anyway, she was really known for that. So that piece is based on that. And they're all based on, you know, anything that I was reading about. And um, so again, there's more, I mean, all of these have, I'll give you one example, Miss Minnie Mossman on the top right. She was the first female, um, 
uh, boat captain on the um, on the uh, Columbia River, um, and which is right outside the Columbia River. There is what is called the um, the, the Pacific uh, Graveyard. Um, because it's where so many ships are lost. And still now it's a very treacherous river. Uh, the estuary when it meets with the sea, it's just really, so she became the first woman, Miss Minnie Mossman. Of course, we don't know her, her name. We only know her husband's last name, but anyway, so, and so I went and looked at sextons and I went at the, the ocean at the, there, I was there and I looked at the, um, the Museum of the Ocean and whatever it's called. And they had a lot of old sectants. So I just kind of mixed all these language. Um, so, and then these are a bunch of the drawings that you saw in that in that video. Um, again, trying referencing things I had learned and this kind of coded vocabulary that came out of it. Um, this is another show that I did uh, in 2017, Western, at the Western Carolina University, and it's called um, um, Appalachia and Abstraction, and it's based on the history of North Carolina, the Appalachian region of North Carolina. And it, again, it, it speaks of anything from encounters is the first time. I was kind of interested in this one, what happened when the first whites arrived in the area and what were their how did they interact and what came culturally was exchanged. One of the things that was exchanged that was interesting, a lot of the, um, the native tribes had a very specific language done with, um, but they immediately incorporated silk thread in their work. It was just kind of these interesting things that changed. And, um, and here is a bunch of these and they all have meanings and they're all based on specific things. And um, we can always go back to that. But so these were all on paper because I was moving. And so I was like, okay, I gotta just have something that I can put on one box flat and ship it because there's nothing else I can do. And it can come back in that same exact block. Um, so then I went to, this is closer now, Florida. I was at, um, this is probably one of the most extraordinary places I've been in residency at the Maitland Art and History Museums. Um, it's just a beautiful, one of the most beautiful campuses I've been in. I was there for six weeks, which was just amazing, by myself at night, which was great. I was just in these Garden of Eden, which is these luxurious plants and in this beautiful, beautiful setting. And so these are definitely straight out references to what I was seeing. And, uh, you know, I went there in January, so it was cold and miserable up here. And then I go down there and it's like, things are already growing and vines are literally growing a foot a minute. And so it was just, you know, so both, both of them, um, reference, you know, the, what I was looking at really. And then some of these reference more of um, the history of there, the, the colors of the Seminole tribes, um, some of the stuff that was found um, in archeological digs, all these kind of stuff is just, you know, references that I kind of break down and becomes its own language. And then this is a video again of what I did there in that one space. So that shows you how much. It also, again, watercolors um, and inks, a lot of that. Um, and I couldn't really stick many things up on the walls because there were like these bricks and it was damp, so everything would fall. <laughs> so it was just kind of going to these kind of like interesting little exercises. So this is basically one, you know, the six weeks residency. Um, It wasn't a big space, but I sure, you know, fell it up through the gills, so. which I tend to do anyway. I'm just so grateful when I can go to one of these places because it's hard to get in them. You know. That's about it. So, and then this is my next, this is the show that I just had in 2020 in Ohio, in Massillon, Ohio. And I'm just giving you kind of a couple examples of these very long scrolls that I call scrolls. They were hanging on grommets, they were hang more like tapestries, real, really. Um, and they're also, again, based like 
on the history of Massillon in Star County, Ohio. The upper one on the left corner, there is fossils, kind of weird drawings. And then above it, those circles are actually from archeological drawings of archeological digs of long lost tribes that used to live in the area. And then it just kind of continues on. There is these crosses because that was the first thing that the settlers would bring in would be churches. That was their way of, you know, immediately that was a thing. And then there is these tumbling tiles and that shape, the black shape is actually um, a very specific shape in uh, Quaker um, religion or beliefs, I should say. And, um, and then all, the founder was abolitionist and um, he had an area that was a secret passageway and you can still see these steps going down and bypassing uh, the main house for people that you know were uh, escaping um, slavery. So they were from, the bottom one was kind of like a real, for me, very hard to do because first of all, I mean, Massillon is where if any of you guys are ladies and gentlemen there and whatever, do you have anything into, in, if you're into football, Massillon is where uh, Brown, the coach Brown devised this whole system of um, what became football, modern football. So the town is absolutely obsessed with football. So I felt like I wanted to honor that, but I don't know anything about football. I know soccer, I grew up with soccer, but football just goes straight over my head. What I all, all I had was, okay, okay well, the Masson team um, is orange and white and their arch enemies, the Canton team is orange and black. So here I was orange and black and white, orange and yeah, no, red and black and orange and white. So this was kind of like a quandary right there, just in terms of colors to try this. So I just kind of, but I came up with this kind of like really crazy tumbling down figures and the bleachers. And then the redeeming moment came when I was looking at the images and they had just repainted the gold post in royal blue. I said, okay, I can use this to kind of break this intensity of it. So that's how I, finally and then there's just the top and the bottom before and after big betty once well lady big betty was the name of the furnace the the main furnace of um of the steel industry in uh steel factory in uh, muscle they're very known for um you know for their steel industry that basically collapsed by the the 80s so um and then this is some of the setting how they looked hanging um i had a few little ones so there were four major pieces. So this is now where we're at. So 2020, <laughs> um, lockdown March here down in Brooklyn. Um, I'm listening to a lot of, you know, generation of the powerful just basically address the fact that so much of what we were told was, an, was either fudged or unrealistic or, you know, our expectations were, you know, changing every second as to how this, pandemic was gonna play out. So there was this, I felt very much like a cog in this system. So um, this is a six by, this is a pretty big painting on um, just using very basic colors to express this kind of sense of not really knowing, stuck in these wheels, on these wheels. So um, this is Triple K USA. And this was um, of course the Black Life Movement and the major marches that were going on. I went to some of the marches here in uh, Brooklyn and these, I made a series of these and like these became what I used was actually the words. So across the, the painting, I think that there is the words racism and then there is the word BLM, there is the word um, KKK. And so, and these are shots close up to and again I have no idea when I start how it's going to develop I try to stay out of the way as much as I can and not impose a structure until it just it's clearly that it knows where it wants to go so um and then this is Posse Comitatus because again this was there was this whole craziness around the whole thing about how in America you know Posse Comitatus was started in the 1400 or 1200 in England and then when the British took over here before the America, well, before the United States, they basically brought over the idea of Posse Comitatus. They got rid of it, but we kept it because it became a way for, you know, sheriffs can have the right to 
just call on the, you know, a committee of people uh, armed. And we know what the consequences are in the lynching of, um, of folks up and down, you know, the United States and how has that been used as a legal, um, you know, way of shielding themselves, you know, from the legality of what they're doing. And so, and then there's, again, there's two competing forces here going up against each other. For some reason, that picket fence became in my head. I didn't know it until later, you know, it became this idea of just that pick that white picket fence, like we all have to go in for that, the white picket fence and how that's the way to live and everything else is pushed back and fought against. So again, it's just 2020 has been just one of those years as we all know. And then these are a bunch of these drawings that are about, um, I think 23 by 23 by, what is it, 20 by 23? Um, again, trying to figure out, listening to, you know, Cuomo's telling us what was going on every day and trying to have a grasp of what was going on with not much result. Um, so they're, they're like, I call them my COVID series. And this is like the latest work that I've been doing in 2021. Off of it already references, you know, there's just giant, I noticed afterwards, there's this giant boot crushing people and it references how um, a very fascist government has been in power and is trying to oppress people here. And it's just been a catastrophic, you know, four years basically. And, and then some, of course, it didn't just happen. Trump didn't just happen. It's not a fluke. It's part of the history of America. Um, this is Big Shoe Barbecue. I, I, decided, I went back, for some reason, I just woke up one morning. I did this very long piece. Um, I was kind of thinking back when I arrived in 1979 um, to the United States. One of the things that we did when my husband and I, we drove across the United States. And, um, and I think that's where my undying love of the American landscape started. I had no idea what how extraordinary it is. And I really encourage any of you who can, if you can't afford it, if you can go and drive around and go see this country, it is just absolutely mind blowing how beautiful the kind. And still because the place, you know, it's gigantic. You still have a lot of areas that are completely untouched and it is just simply beautiful. So I came in and we were living in Hoboken just, dense, dangerous area. Um, but then we went, we left. And then, you know, we went to Indiana to some of my husband's friends and we went to, like if they said, oh, we got to take you to barbecue. I'd never had a barbecue. And the barbecue was called Big Shoe Barbecue. And and the man manning the counter, we walked in this place and it was just gigantic person. I had never seen somebody, I think he was like about six, because our friend was six four. And he probably was like six, six or six, seven, really. And he had this entire counter covered with meat. And I was just like, it blew my mind because I've never seen anything like, I've never seen that much meat in one spot, never seen somebody that big and manning this gigantic counter anyway. So it stayed with me and Big Shoe Barbecue was the name of this place because his shoes were gigantic, of course. So um, this is new work and I'm not quite sure you know, what is going to happen. I'm just trying to like stay out of the way a little bit and not, you know, just kind of reacting to what seems to be happening in my head or around me. Um, this is, we planted a garden and this was done um, after January 6th and uh, take over, you know, the assault on the Capitol. Um, we did plant a garden in 2020. I actually did. I mean, um, you know, we just dug up parts of the backyard and just kind of had to do something physical during this months of lockdown. And, but then they became, I didn't quite know until I was doing it, it became like three sections. It seems to have three sections with the garden. And then there was these boots again, so that whole, like, you know, jack booting thugs that are, have been oppressing people and, and attacking um, people of color in particular in this country. And this whole thing, it just began then the assault onto the Capitol. I think it all became one, one piece. It's really quite big, as you can see, 84 by 182. So again, here, the balance is done in terms of painting. I was trying to figure out how much I wanted it to be uh, very well executed and how much I wanted it to be free. So like, it kind of worked. I do like this painting, actually. You know, I don't usually like what I do in the end, but it, that's just kind of the way it is. I think um, 
think that's about it. There you go. So anyway, so that's it. <laughs> so if you have questions, we can stay on this on the, or however, let's see. I can't hear you. If, um, if oh, anyone okay. has a question, if at all, maybe unmute mute yourself. I have yes. a oh, hi. question. Hi. Yeah. Your really large pieces, are they on canvas or are they also on paper? Um, the biggest one, except for the ones from Florida, the Florida ones are on paper, but everything else is on canvas, yeah. So with the heavy coverage of paint, how do you keep them in a position to be able to ex exhibit them and things like that? How do you care? Just them up. They're, they're, you know, it's, it's flash paint, so it's not, um, you know, it stays pretty, um, it, it, you know, once it's down, it's fine. It doesn't really- You just roll it up and it stays- Yeah, roll it up, face out, yeah. and I just, you know, and then I ship them in, in these, like those, um, those tubes that you pour concrete in, it's like yep. cardboard, but solid, you know, yep. Yep. or something like that. Yeah, those are really helpful and easy to ship stuff. You don't have to worry oh. too much, so yeah. So. Hmm. Armello? You've unmuted. Do you have a question? And Jeanette, yeah. too. Um, so your medium is very unique. Um, how did you come across your medium? <laughs> um, well, you mean like the, the way, the use of, of, of the type of, of thing? Or the, yeah. 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 Well, actually, I think it's because I mean, I, like I said, I had worked with oil for a long time and it became mm -hmm. really a it's just I couldn't use it anymore. It was just so, um, it was all about oil. <laughs> you know, it was all about itself. And I was just kind of like getting lost in that and feeling that I was just doing these things just because they were beautiful. And I just kind of like a really frustrated. And when I, you know, that one um, uh, video where I said that I was just kind of had hit the wall and I wanted to redo it. So I on purpose just kind of focused on just doing you know, when you draw one line at a time, one line at a time, something happens, you know, where you just literally can dismantle your mind and, and kind of try to get into something else, you know, and that's what happened. And so when I saw what I was doing there, it was like, wait a minute, I'm just seeing the reason why I realized that for a long time, I had been throwing gesso to this white, to this um, oil and trying to flatten it and trying to knock off its shyness and all that. And I was like, wait a minute, I mean, I don't have to do this. You know, it's just ridiculous. So working with gouache reconnected me with this thing that I really like, which is this flatness, you know, of, of certain things. I'm not interested in depth of field. It's obvious. It's just not something that I'm interested in, but, um, and so then gouache cost a fortune and I make big pieces. So I went for flash and, and mural paint, this cheap mural paint, that's what I use. And that's been really great because then um, if I wanna, you know, if I, I usually tend to add like cheap, like um, pigments from, um, you know, like garment pigments that are really cheap, you know, and I pour them in and then it just kind of gets even flatter and, you know, more kind of like just sticks. I mean, what I like about it is that I put it down, it stays there, it doesn't do anything, you know, and it doesn't move. And yeah, so that's why, yeah. Well, I don't know if you want to uh, stop sharing. Um, but oh, okay. I'm not too sure if uh, anybody has a question, particularly to um, a piece. So maybe we'll keep it on just for a moment. Um, oh, should I? Okay. Let's see, uh, Jason has a question. But everybody else has asked Somebody their questions. Has said, I don't know. So. Okay. Um, Jeanette, did you have a question? You have unmuted. Yeah, um, I do. So um, first of all, I want to say I love your work. Um, it's everything is so deep. You know, like like you said, like everything that you do has meaning. And even though your work is so simple, I feel like you can see that in it you can see the depth and the meaning and the experience and the knowledge that's in everything um abstract art for me is kind of baffling i'm i'm a graphic design major and i'm also an illustrator and i mostly have like a, a style that's realist um i draw what i see right. where, what i have seen Whereas um, with abstract art, it's representational and you're more drawing what you feel. 
And well, as a graphic designer, I would like to be able to have, I would like to be able to um, incorporate a more basic style mm -hmm. into my repertoire, because I feel like that's important as a graphic designer. So um, I, my question is, can you describe your process around creating your art with your basic techniques of line and shape and form and expressing complex ideas? How do I uh, go about it? I think the, the first thing is there's really like hundreds of small little sketches. I mean, I have boxes filled with, you know. So I, I think what I try to do, and that might be something that, that could be helpful um, when you given um, an assignment of any kind, right? I mean, you give yourself an assignment or you're given by somebody or, or um, I think when you're first reading something, it tells you you need to do, um, you know, uh, something, a graphic design all based on this new car, right? But you're reading, say, the specs of the car before what I try to do is grasp this one image that comes before I get too Baroque on it. Because I can do Baroque like nobody's business, okay? I could just pile on so much information, it would just... So what I try to do is really grasp on that and then say, this is the basic shape of the information, whatever it may be. And then I try to develop as many of these shapes that I can that are correlated to the information and then they start feeding each other you know it's just kind of a natural it becomes its own language which is and that's why like I think working with history in different places what it does for me is that it's all my work but it can be looking different de depending on where I am or what I'm trying to speak of you know does that make sense but it's really is that moment when you read the information if I try and pay attention with that moment before it's like the word, I always give the same example, but the word apple, right? Before you get to the letter A and the red apple with the little stem, there is something else. That's what I'm looking for, is that moment where something, it's a piece of information gives me something else before it becomes obvious. So that's the way I do it. But I mean, I think everybody and others will do we'll take the final shape of something, a very obvious thing, and then we'll, they will start cutting it out, you know, cutting it back. It really depends on how you work, you know, we all just kind of have a different ways of approaching, you know, so that's, yeah. Does that make sense at all? I don't know if that's yeah. you. <laughs> yeah, the like, you talking about like, thinking about the essence of something before you get complicated. Yeah. Makes sense. Yeah. Um, do you, have you always worked in this style? Um. You know, as far as I can, I mean, I remember when I was a little kid, I think that's, I would, you know, again, that whole history stuff, I was terrified of everything as a kid. And I think I just spent a lot of time just expressing these things that I was reading and or, or the way the, the adults were, it, it was always a, a language of, um, of shapes and, and how they connected to each other. I mean, so um, I did spend, a, you know, a number of years working in, um, figurative language because I really felt like I needed to own that. I needed to learn it. I did a lot of life drawing. I did spend a lot of time with that. I just, you know, shading, 3D, blah, 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 so that I could actually have a sense of the metric of what a human mind is because we all have, you know, as a person, you have a metric. You have a sense of how things are around you and how they fit so that, say, um, a tiger doesn't have you, you, you are seeing a certain way because you're human. Mm -hmm. So I think doing live drawing gives you that meter. Mm -hmm. And I still do it. Every once in a while I'll go and I'll do it. And, you know, um, and I think it's a really good exercise because you have to go into, you can go into a very detailed chunk of something and find, watch your brain when you look at something. Your brain doesn't need every spot on a line to know it's a line. And I think that helps a lot. You know, you can just look at something and go, oh, that's that's a hand, but you don't really need the entire hand. And whoever looks at what you do knows that, even if it's way in the back of their mind. I mean, like you can draw a bad tiger. You cannot draw a bad human, a body because people will know. 
even if they don't know about it, <laughs> you know, the anatomy, you just know it because it, you're imprinted with it. It's your survival. It's your, you know, does that make sense? Mm-hmm. So, <laughs> John, you had a question. You had your hand up. Hello. Maybe you guess Carol could want to not, not share this. I'm sorry. Hi, Carol. How are you doing? Hi. Um, I love your work. How you doing? I love your work. Um, I took some time to look at it before I got on. And um, I'm an abstract artist and I, I love your intricate line work. And thank you. I, uh, I stared at the picture um touchdown uh town for a while. <laughs> and I started seeing different things in it, and I love artwork that does that. Um sometimes when I do artwork, I uh I'll draw something I didn't know what I was drawing at the right. time. So um also I want to comment about the a student before who mentioned that uh she was an illustrator and that she draws what she sees. I, I totally get where she's coming from. Sure. Um her trying to figure out how an abstract artist goes about what they do um and she's right for me it's all about feel um a lot of times i'll go in and i'm drawing something and it's just an urge where i draw it and then it becomes something it wasn't something i i, I was thinking about before and my question to you is um with you I, a lot of your work is connected to um a memory or an emotion or a statement which is great but do you ever just draw freely and then it becomes you look at it and you're like hey this this makes up this kind of statement or is it always designed and you're like you have an idea before you go in um no i also do that i think part of it is just that because i'm always i try to stay plugged in what goes on all the time right so i think my mind is constantly processing and making connections with whatever history i know and what is going on right now why is this going on so it's always in the back you know it becomes this this layer of information that just kind of connects to each other. As I, so when I'm drawing, you know, I mean, I don't know, this is one of those things that I do when I do, I don't know, like when I'm doing Zooms, you know, I just kind of go through all of these line work, you know, I don't really, I don't know where it's gonna go, but I also know that it's part of something, you know? And then I, I'll, I'll go back and I'll go, oh, wow, what, why was that? And then I think, oh yeah, I was thinking about that. So it all just kind of, I'm constantly sketching stuff. So, um, so yeah, that, that was the one thing that I didn't wanna, I, it's hard to explain this thing with the, with the historical context, I think, because, um, you know, it sounds like I've got it all figured out. No, I mean, I, I spend a lot of time learning, but then when I'm done with that, it all disappears. All these art books, these maps, all this stuff get, I take them out of my studio completely. I don't wanna hear it. So then at that point, and let me say, I actually do love your, I do love your, your, your work that you're doing with uh, just all these statements you're making. It, it's beautiful. That one you did, uh, Triple K USA, yeah. that really spoke to me. That, that's a part of the colors, the contrast between, it's, it's, that's an amazing piece. Thank you. So, I mean, that's the thing, you know, I was just, I think because there was this, whole, you know, uh, you know, there's good people on both sides. There was Charlottesville and there was the marches and all this stuff. And I'm like, you know, it was just the rage that I was feeling, I think needed to go somewhere. Um, but I think because I know the history of it, I was able to, I think, you know, I wasn't going into it cold. I need to have that, that emotional connection to whatever was going on. So I went to marches and I just kind of took that. And there's another one that I have that was called, the, that's called the Marcher's Love. And it's more about, the opposite of that, the beauty of seeing all these people marching in Brooklyn and all these people hanging out of the windows and cheering us on. And so that contrast that still happens in America, I think that's part of the thing too. I always feel like I have dual things going on in my work. And I think part of it is that, or it might just be my crazy mind. But so, I mean, yeah, the, the, there is a lot of intuitive work. I mean, a lot of it is intuitive. It's just simply um, channeling pain or anger or happiness, whatever it is, into filter through the information into the canvas. So makes sense. So <laughs> thank you. Anyone else have a question for Carol? I know J Jason has one as well, but he wants to have uh, the students have a, a say first before we wear her out too much. Should I um, get out of the thing? I yeah, guess. maybe. I don't think anyone Okay. It, it seems to be okay that I guess if you want to go back in at some point, we can do that. But okay. this, it, it's easier for me because then I can see them all. I just want to say that it resonated with me when you when you like referenced your childhood a little mm -hmm. bit, and 
you know, like the idea of just having like a childlike mind right. when you're doing abstract work, like a child doesn't care, <laughs> you know, they're just feeling and just whatever comes out, comes out. And I feel like mm -hmm. that's kind of what you're doing too. Like you, like you've like kept that like childlike kind of like intuition. You have to tap into that. You know, I think the, 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 the trick of course is to um, develop enough skills to, to, you know, because a child is not an artist, you have to, you know what I mean? So you have to kind of about, try to figure out enough, develop what it is that's, you have that's yours and then try to maybe, but you know, figure out what am I not good at and how do I go about buffering the rest so that it's not so vis visible that I'm lousy at something else, you know? Mm -hmm. So you just balance that out, you know, it's just constant kind of struggle. I think in, in, in uh, art making, you have to constantly know your limitations and, and how, which ones can you improve on and which ones mm -hmm. are just hopeless. You know, like I'm, I'm not, there's no way in hell I've never been able to draw a straight line. I am a klutz, it never comes out straight. It's impossible. My handwriting is lousy. I spend, you know, <laughs> I finally said, you know what, that's it. This is the way I am. It's not going to happen. I can make very delicate lines, but they are not going to be perfect they have you know <laughs> so so sale you had a question uh yeah i was just Hi. wanted to ask uh carol if she felt uh if europe was a lot more uh appreciative of the arts than america yeah for sure. <laughs> that's, I feel that way here. <laughs> yeah, oh gosh, yeah. I mean, that's very true. I mean, I think it's just because it's part of, um, I think there's a narrative here of, of you know, you are an artist because you can't really do anything else. You're not, you lousy at everything else. You know, I mean, I think there's a narrative of childlike kind of thing, whereas in, I think in Europe and, and in other, I mean, pretty much everywhere except the United States, I think you know, there's this obsession against, anything that that's um creative and or intellectual i mean it just doesn't you know we don't want to hear it here whereas you know i can see like in europe there is an understanding that um you know art making is something that you hopefully get better but you it's going to take you decades and that's just the way it is you know it's not something that's a given and so yeah and there's a lot more money put in and but you also you know surrounded by works of art I mean you just grow up with that I mean just everywhere you look it's just some oh look there's another <laughs> naked statue you know at the corner I mean it's like oh okay this is great thank you you know it's just kind of part of the visual vocabulary you grew up with so yeah, especially and, here in Rochester <laughs> I'm sorry here in Rochester there's so much beautiful art everywhere yeah and it feels like people just walk right by it well, I but I appreciate it. <laughs> I think the more there is, the better it is. Though I think it's, you know, I think it becomes. Um, my hope is that eventually, you know, instead of having your standard just lousy, you know, um, guy on a uh, on a horse on a pedestal, you know, maybe you know, if we have more and more of other things, I think it becomes a, a visual vocabulary that people carry with them as they go along in their lives or live somewhere else. But I mean, it takes a lot of money to, for public art, you know, and, <laughs> and the willingness to do all kinds of stuff that may not be, you know, um, just, you know, it's just the way it is. But yeah, it's much more appreciated, that's for sure. Music, art, dance, I mean, it's all, you know, and they're very rigorous in the way they train, you know, you, you start very early, you, you know, conservatory, you started when you're like, four years old then you do it parallel to your regular education i mean it's just really kind of it's understood as a you know it takes just as much skill to do that as be a you know a, i don't know work in uh, physics or something you know so yeah thank you anyone else have a question for carol I know Jason does. Jason has a question. <laughs> Do you want me to ask now? Sure. We're good to, good right. to keep the ball rolling. Okay. So um, I arrived a few minutes late due to traffic issues. 
Um, so you may have already addressed this. And uh -huh. Kathy, I know this is your portfolio class. So these are like, you know, last semester students. So you may have already addressed this in class. But Carol, you, you kind of addressed something that I never heard when I was these students age, and that is um, the act of a residency, uh -huh. right? When I, when I was their age getting my associate's degree, I heard about transfer schools. I heard about getting a job. I heard about the act of teaching to make a living. Yeah, right. But right. one of the things it's like, I think like residencies are like the hidden secret of the art world. Can you talk a little bit about um, two sides of it, right? Um, tell, just explain kind of what they are uh -huh. and why they're so great, but also if you have any like tips or things that you could pass on to the students about yeah. how to find them or apply for them, kind of what they're looking for. Because I think residencies are amazing and I know, know people who've done a bunch and they get so much out of them. So mm -hmm. if you could just kind of talk about the residencies in general. I think would really be helpful for the students. Yeah, I think my first residency I did, um, I, I, you know, it was actually in Italy for a month. Um, I, I think one of the things that I, what I like about it is that you really end up in this, this little world that you create from scratch. And then you spend, you know, two weeks, three weeks, four weeks, whatever you have. And then that's it, it's its own world. It really is kind of like an extraordinary gift that you're given to be able to do that. I mean, you, I, I am so grateful when I go to a residency. I mean, I literally hit, hit the ground running. I don't waste half a second to start producing and making stuff because it's just such a, nothing, there, you, you can't worry about, oh, I didn't do the dishes. You can't worry about, oh, I should have paid that bill. You're out of there. You're not home anymore. You're gone. You just like doesn't matter. And a lot of times, although it's changing, unfortunately, but a lot of times you're in places that are far away enough that there is no internet, or there's only internet in the main house. So your house and your studio has no internet, which is fantastic. I highly, highly recommend that. If you go on a residency, make sure you unplug. Leave your you leave your phone at, at the little house you're staying at. Don't go in the studio with it. You do not need it. On the contrary, it will mess you up. You don't need to be checking with your friends. You don't need to look at Instagram. You do this all year. You're given that month as a gift. Spend the time to completely disconnect because I guarantee you, you will find something you did not know about yourself and your work. It just happens every time to everyone that I've spoken to. It's not just me, it's just a real gift. So how to get to it? Apply, 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 apply. That's all you can do. Um, for, there is a lot of stuff for emerging artists, which is really good for you where you're at. So you're emerging artists. I think there's a lot of stuff offered for um, young folks or people who are just finished and, um, so I think that's a really good one. So you have more chances than see somebody like me to get in. So, but you need to apply, apply and don't count on it, but also use it to get better and better of writing proposals. Cause every time you're gonna write it, maybe you'll get better for the next one. Um, look at what, the same thing as if you're gonna look at it, you apply for a competition, look at who was, um, you know, you're not going to go to a residency that, you know, I don't know, supports um, sculptors if you're a painter. Of course, that's an obvious thing, but I'm not just going to just look at who they had as residents before. Is it something that is it a, is it a community that you're interested to be in? Um, is it a community that you're going to learn from and that you can share something with? I mean, those are very common things and simple things to think about. So be mindful of who what you're going to take your time because this takes they take a lot of time sometimes to you know you're writing a 300 words essay on what you're going to do it's only 300 words you know oh okay i'm going to be there for a whole month what do i say oh i love you know i want to go in this you know i, I live in the city i want to go and spend some time in the countryside that's not going to cut it. You have to come up with something concrete as to, even if you get there and don't do any of it, because mostly they'll say that. They'll say, this is just for us and you are not bound to do what you said. So spend a lot of time. I think as you get better in applying, your chances of course go up. 
Um, and, you know, some of them request they, they want, you know, references. I have harassed Kathleen enough times with that. I mean, you know, just you have people, you know, in the business, try to ask them for their, um, you know, their recommendation and stuff like that. But I think applying is the only way to go. And then a lot of times you get, I mean, I get turned down all the time. It's just the way it is. You know, there's way too many of us and not enough places to, um, but they're kind of, they are the hidden gem. I mean, you really end up where you wake up and breakfast is there, lunch is there, you know, dinner is there. You don't have to shop. You don't have to cook. You don't have to do any of it. You know, you just kind of like in your little world. And I think, it's kind of an extraordinary moment because you don't really, nobody really has that. I mean, in an ideal world, you know, you should be able to do art 24 hours a day if you're an artist, but that's not the reality of our lives, you know? So yeah, I really, I, I really recommend that just apply, apply a lot. And then I think once in the, like there is um, race, which is REIs. And then there is, um, if you just simply Google, just start with that Google uh, artist residencies. And then you can go, some people will go, I mean, you can go all over the world with it. Some of them, you know, they, they request money. And so that might be a problem. Others don't just, you know, start applying and don't worry about it. I mean, you know, don't take it personally and um, just do it. That's all. I mean, I really recommend it. And it just, it's an amazing time. So is that, that, make, is that, did I answer everything on that or? It's perfect. Okay. Hey, Jeanette, Jeanette. But, oh, but if I can just real quick follow up with one thing you said that I think is important for the students to really understand is that you're writing these proposals. Yeah. You know, we get, we get wrapped up in as artists that we have to draw well and we have to do yeah, all yeah. these things well, but we don't think about how important writing is. Yeah. But writing is important to be able to concisely write yeah. what you're going to do, what your work is like. So, uh, you know, and, very much so, yeah. Yeah, I would just stress that for all the students that writing is important to be able to write about your work and 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 just be clear yeah. how you're writing. Be clear so. what you want and and also like I think um you know, it like they want the proposal, but they're going to look at your CV, they're going to look at your um uh, at your artist statement, uh, you know, all they're going to look at your website, all of those need to be ready. So, you know, it becomes this game that you have to, and then but the good thing is that they happen twice a year, right? Around February, March, and then October, November, last when they all come in. So you have these two times and you, where you have to really make sure that, you know, hmm, maybe I should work on my website, which I should a little more, or, you know, maybe I should up update my CV. Maybe I should update my, um, artist statement. And, um, you know, recruit people around you, have somebody else write for you. And then what do you think of my work and have somebody write and then you just take bits and parts and, you know, just keep practicing. It becomes a, you know, something that um, it's hard. It's not easy. It's not easy for me because again, English is not my, you know, my, <laughs> it's my third language. So I get, you know, I have to work on it, you know, so, but it's also, it's kind of an interesting exercise. It, it makes you, you have to, it forces you to kind of, at this moment, this is what I'm about. Six months later, I'll be something else. But right now, this is what I'm about. It makes you have to focus on what you're doing right now. And I think that's a good exercise for an artist, reassessing where you're at at any given moment. So, Nettie, you had your hand up again. Yeah. You have question? Um, what are your suggestions for how to go about finding um, art shows and residents? I think, like I said, Google artist residency, number one. And then there's some that are like extensive that literally will give you stuff from the entire world. You can go, you can enter, oh, I wanna go to Argentina and then they'll just give you what there is. So it's really not that complicated now. Are there know. certain websites that you that you know, you know of offhand that we can use? Yeah, if I can remember, I can't remember the top of my head. I mean, I usually just li literally like, oh, you know, there is like um, submittable and then there is, um, there's call for entry uh, cafe, cafe. cafe listing you know those are call for entries and then um you know once you pull one out and then i think new york has one that's specifically for for new york state um just uh, literally like google is your friend in this stuff because it really you know just 
just our artist residencies or artist competitions, whatever you're looking for. You, and then within that, you can say, I want one that I don't have to pay. The, the difficult thing with competitions um, is, of course, the fees. They go now between $30 to $50 a pop, and it's not nothing. So um, again, if you want to submit a piece for a competition, look at the, the, the venue, look at the juror. I mean, if you're an abstract painter, don't you know, don't send them the money if the juror is a figurative thing. It's not going to happen. Just don't bother, you know. Um, you know, and then just look at what that person has juried before, maybe. Do research. Do a lot of research because you don't want to waste your money and your time. You want to make sure. And then know what you want. Like for me, I don't. Residency, I, I refuse. I will not do it. I will not share a studio. It's not going to happen. I'll share, a, I'll share a house, I'll share housing, I'll share a bathroom. I will not share a studio because that's my time. It's not going to happen. So I'll just look and say, oh, shared studio, never mind. So pick what it is that you can, you want out of it. And then these are the things, the parameters that I'm willing to go with and work with that. And maybe you'll have 10 left and that's fine. You know, and then out of the 10, we'll say, well, emerging artists. Oh, well, then I have three left. I'll send those three. So. Okay, be, be strategic, don't waste your time, you know? I mean, just take your time and then just kind of, because like I said, it's only twice a year. So you have the time to look through. You know, Students in the, in the book are twice work. a year. I'm sorry? What's only twice a year? I'm sorry? The calls. What? The what? what did the you call. say? The call for art is only twice a year? Well, the, the residency. ones that come in like between um, March, uh, you know, between March and April, like February, March, April, and then, you know, around August, um, October. That's so they just do it twice a year for like residencies and um, maybe big shows and stuff. Yeah, I mean, um, oh. gallery shows that they're really hard to get. That's just kind of like a crapshoot. I mean, that's very hard. I don't really get those that much at all. I mean, it's not a, you know, so you have to, again, you have to identify what gallery you would like to work with and, and just kind of go for it and see if they take you. But there's a lot of us again, you know, so. Um, yeah, I mean. Okay, I apologize if I asked a repeat question. I had to leave for a minute. Oh no, that's fine. Yeah, she no, that's lives fine. in the city to move their cars. Um, <laughs> there's a um, there's a chapter in the book artwork that covers that a lot, and there's also uh, links to some of those things. And I know that you're you're looking for that kind of thing, Nettie. So. Um, <clears throat> I think we might have time for maybe one more question. I want to, I promised Carol we'd stay under an hour for her. <laughs> and, um, but if anyone has a burning question and then we can let check. Carol go back to her studio. Yeah. yeah. Well, I think that's about it. It looks like. No, no questions. Tony, did you have one? Oh, okay. So Cam on mic. Cameron. Sorry about that. Um, yeah. Oh, which no, one? I don't have any questions, Cam. Sorry. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Um, I, sorry. <laughs> is it, uh, is it working uh, for me? I can hear, we can yeah. hear you. Make, can make hear a question. You. Thank you. Yeah, I'm a bit nervous. Um, oh, wow. So I'm curious as to kind of how you, I guess, start your, um, basically begin the um, art making process once you've researched everything and um, so once you kind of get down to actually start it I find myself often kind of paralyzed by fear that the work is not going to turn out or something and that keeps me from drawing nearly as much as I used to um, yeah. but I'm kind of curious how do you sort of overcome any of that fear how do you um, how do you begin your drawing sketching process? How often do you just sketch? Well, I, I, I think you can't judge the work. <laughs> um, you know, I mean, you can judge it at the end, but you certainly can't do it when you're picking up that pencil. You know, I mean, it doesn't, I think I've learned, because I, I, I've been destructive. I've thrown hundreds of drawings and paintings out to the trash. So it's not like I, but I've learned to, recognize that more as fear as, a, a, as opposed to, okay, this is something that's actually teaching me something. All I was doing, it was just re reinforcing my fears and my anxieties rather than saying, oh, you know what? 
to stop this mess. You know, it doesn't matter. I don't know. I think I've decided that it's okay not to know what the piece is going to look like. Um, and I feel comfortable now, but it took me a while. I'm not saying that it's easy to, for, you know, if there is anxiety and you want to be able to say, you know, oh gosh, I want to do something with this, but really the bottom line is just a piece of canvas and a piece of paper. You know what I mean? That's what I keep telling. I, so now I'm much more comfortable with just failure, really. I think that's, you know, um, nothing that I do, I'm really happy with. I mean, I have moments in a painting, I'll say, well, that's good. You know, that was a good, a good transition, that worked. But, you know, it's not like I can say, oh, you know, but I think another way to look at it that I also think that might be helpful around anxiety is like, I want to learn something every time. So if a painting teaches me something, whether it is like, oh, a new mixing of a color or, or a brushstroke or, or some kind of connection with something else, you know, that's more metaphorical, whatever it is, that's great. You know what I'm saying? Does that help at all? I mean, I think don't judge the word. You can't, you can't, you have to just do it. There's nothing else. I mean, the, 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 the choice is, you know, that's the choice. You either don't do it or you do it. And, you know, for me, I can't live without doing it. So I'm also just a pain in the butt if I'm not doing it. That's my family. It's like, go to your studio, you know? So does that make sense? Did that help at all? Yes, honestly, it really did. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, I mean, don't worry about it. It's just a piece of paper. <laughs> <You know? laughs> it's all right, you know? So anyway. All right. All right. Well, we're going to let you off the hook, Carol. Thank you so thank much, you for much, everyone. And good luck to you all. And if you have any questions, just get my email from Kathleen. I'll try and, you know, I can help you out or whatever. If there's any suggestions or, you know, whatever you need, I can certainly share some of whatever I've learned through the years, you know. So good luck to you all. Okay. Thank, thank you. So Thanks again. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. So great seeing Bye, you. Thank you. Bye-bye. So much fun seeing you. Thank you so much.